So let's start with you. You have a science degree, right? So you uh, come from this place of loving science to begin with, correct? True. So it goes really far back. Both parents were teachers. Um, so I feel like education was like very much the focus of the family. Uh, they were both high school teachers. And then I fell in love, I would say, with science probably like in, as far back as like sixth grade. Like, I mean, it was a very long, long time ago. I remember specifically there was a microscope um, demo that we did at this place called Big Darby Creek. It like literally blew my mind, like that there were living things within the water that we were kind of just playing in. And it felt like it was almost like someone telling you that, oh yeah, there's this whole other invisible like life that's happening out in space, but you just haven't seen it yet. And here it is. And you're just like, what? Like it just mind, just total mind explosion. So I kind of followed biology because it was most things, mostly like things revolving around like living life forms. And so um, I guess all life forms are living. Um, and so really I, I followed that and then I became a biology major in college. And then I uh, started studying organic chemistry in the lab. So I became a lab tech for uh, a guy named Dr. Callum. We went and did this uh, published piece about, uh, it's really, really kind of nerdy stuff, but it's <laughs> Doing the anamer mm -hmm. of uh, mannose, so it's D-mannose, and we were doing complex carbohydrate um, building through protecting groups, through washing. Uh, so it's like very, very like in-depth um, chemistry background. But then also uh, I, I worked um, with a biological sciences department in college. And I was, so I was pre-med, I, I worked in a hospital. I was like very much going to go into medicine. And then along the way, um, I started studying at Yale University economics and then video production in the summer. And so I went to Ohio State, but then I went to Yale in the summertime. And that changed the route because I was like, oh, man, this is really cool. Like, you know, you can you can film, you know, almost like a demonstration. You can talk about what you're excited about. And there was sort of a route for this because before this time frame of the Internet, it was just all linear television. So you had to pitch something, you had to have a program it was very gated then youtube came around and i was like whoa like this is a whole new world um and so that's sort of where i like branched instead of went instead of going specifically into medicine i started this other path of like psychom basically okay so how did it start did you make one video and then it just kind of spinned out of control from there it's weird because they're not totally related so i was a professional stunt rollerblader when i was a teenager and I found that I really loved performance and then also like working in and around sort of like video production. So my first job out of college was with College Humor. I went three years in New York doing like kind of a crash course of media, meaning like I was doing hosting, modeling, acting, all sorts of things just to understand what it was all about. How do you get an agent? How do you do it all? Then after two weeks, only two weeks on Big Brother, I came out to California and I was like, you know what? I've seen YouTube prove itself enough. I think this is a career pathway where you can really sort of double down on a niche. And so I started with um, videos very similar to a YouTuber at the time called Vsauce and then um, Hank Green's um, SciShow. So it was like green screen. We chose uh, things that were very broad. Why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? Kind of explainer content. We did that for like almost three years. And in that time frame. I got offered a full-time job um, for the Weather Channel. So a show that was shooting in Burbank uh, called Brainstorm. It was an interstitial, which is like three to four minute segments for live TV. And so that gave me sort of an understanding and perspective of like how to create science for TV. And then I basically formulated a company that started making science content, both for TV, for digital, for my own own, own owned and operated channels. And it kind of branched from there. And then we just, at some point along the way, we got very much into what are referred to as practical science experiments, things that you can actually like show as a demonstration. Then I went on a, it was basically, I went on um, the Today Show like 10 times. And then uh, America's Got Talent reached out and they're like, hey man, you've done this so many times. You just want to come on AGT. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Let's do it. Then that started like a live show, like a live science demonstration. And that sort of bred out what we did for all of our different um, YouTube and TikTok all those different channels because we felt that like there was such a good connection between showing science and then sort of experiencing it. And then also sort of curating in a way that wasn't so far off in the distance that people couldn't understand it, but that was 
somewhat within the realm of uh, understanding because we were using items that you could either find around the house or maybe in your garage, with the exception of maybe, you know, a couple chemicals or some device or something like that. Right. I saw you sent um, ice cream to the outer limits of our atmosphere. Where did that <laughs> idea come from and how did it play out? <laughs> So this was a really like, so within the YouTube space, um, I forget who said this, but like, essentially there are so many ideas that get recirculated, right? So like an idea will happen and then you'll think, hey, how can I either improve this idea or go a different direction with it? And so this happens a lot within art and video and so on and so forth. And it, we, we saw some video of somebody sending something to the edge of outer space. And I thought, that's incredible. That's wild. I would love to see that footage for myself, but I don't want to just do it. Like, I don't want to just send something. I want to use this as like a learning opportunity. So I thought like, well, what am I the most curious about? And I thought, well, the thing that I'm most curious about is like, how quickly does it get cold? Like if I were strapped into that balloon, at what point would I be like, oh, wow, it's like, it's way too cold. So I thought like, how quickly would ice cream then melt from the ground if it were hot on the way up to the edge of outer space? What's really interesting about outer space is like there are technical limits, but there's no like technical like hard cut for the atmosphere. It kind of just like fades and then you're just like kind of out in outer space. And so it's a very gradual, incredibly long distance for where the atmosphere turns into space. And so you don't technically get to space in like the edge of outer space, there's still like miles to go. <laughs> um, but this was so fascinating to me. And it, as it turns out, not to ruin this experiment, but like it gets cold really fast. So yeah. it gets cold so fast that we actually like preheated the cone or sorry, pre-cooled the cone because we were very worried that it would just melt before it got there. And then, you know, the, the thumbnail would basically just be like a melted cone and <laughs> in, <laughs> in like a, the upper atmosphere. But as it turns out, it gets really cold really fast. I think I'm around like 10,000 feet. I mean, it's like, it's pretty chilly and it, it gets to 10,000 feet like within a couple minutes. The best part is when you eat the ice cream at the end. How did you even find <laughs> it? Like, were you tracking it the whole time and just chased it down? So like half the fun of this particular experiment is literally finding it, like finding it afterwards because the part that is totally unpredictable there's no drone that's guiding it once the balloon pops it just you know comes down through a parachute but it it's, it's sort of you know in the, the very thin part of the atmosphere it's it's falling basically and then eventually it kind of picks up on either a trade wind or or a wind that's more you know because there's lots of different winds some are happening at the upper ends of the atmosphere others are you know ground winds so it, it zigzags all over the place and um, you don't really know where it's going to end up. And I think that's kind of like the fun of the whole equation. And so um, one of the, uh, the you put a GPS tracker on it. So half the fun is, are you going to be able to recover this thing? Uh, in our scenario, we launched in a very like normal part of California, I meaning it was like Bishop where there's roads and there's towns and gas stations. And it ended up in Death Valley, where there is not that. And so we took this like rental minivan, like kind of like off-roading. <laughs> and we ended up finding it at like 4 a.m. It was um, it was it was like that was like a 24-hour shoot. Like that was like a real, we did not expect it. We just kind of pushed through. We all drank Red Bull and it was uh we really found that thing at like four in the morning, no sleep, kind of dealio. But it was it was exciting nonetheless. I mean, some of these ideas are crazy. Do you have just notebooks filled with ideas or are you just coming up with stuff on the fly? How, how does the creative process work? So there's really funny, um, I like ideas always hit you at two, I would say two times of the day, like mostly. It's right when you wake up, very early in the morning or right when you go to sleep. So I have this um, kind of like on my phone, like I have a note section and I just log them all and then I put them into a Google sheet and then they just kind of stack. And so every once in a while, like some random concept will come in. I'm like, oh, that's a that's a good idea. And I'll throw it into that that Google Sheet and then kind of review it. Say, hey, like when should we do this one? Is this one just too wacky? Is this one too crazy? And now we have a team. So the team is really cool because the team now brings stuff to the table that I wasn't able to do. Meaning like I wouldn't say my, my background's like in like mechanical engineering or uh, electrical engineering. But now we have someone on the team who who is. And his name's Luke. And so he's able to bring this whole new perspective of possibility to the table, like just randomly, like this is one idea. 
Um, there's this little robot dog called Spot. It was it was created by Boston Dynamics, and it's like a it's a basically it's a robot that looks like a dog, and it and it can kind of like move around. And, and I I saw it in Switzerland, like with my own two eyes. They, they brought it out as this demo for this like branded content piece that I was doing at this company. Just had one, and I and I was like, okay, I logged that information. And then I moved in this new house. And on day one, my dog had a coyote encounter. And it's like, the dog's like 50 pounds, so she could probably, you know, hold her own. But I thought, that's scary. I don't want, you know, the dog to be in danger of um, the the coyote. And speaking of which, my dog is about to fight the the people who are cutting our lawn. But anyway, so if you hear the dog, that's, that's our puppy. <laughs> no, but, so I thought, hey, got up. As soon as you said dog, he popped up and started walking around. <laughs> so it, it, it dawned on me, hey, maybe I could program Spot to basically be this like coyote guard. You know, we could maybe program this ro this robotic dog to have a really deep bark. It could be GPS located. It could be, you know, motion sensored. It could turn on, it could have red eyes. So maybe now we could have a robot guard dog for the coyote situation. So it's like, that's a crazy idea. But, you know, those things only happen, you know, right before you're falling asleep and you just kind of think, oh, that's a crazy idea. Maybe we could actually do this. Interesting. Um, okay, so tell me about the fire tornado. How did that work? So the fire tornado is actually like, so there are some science experiments that are like tried and true. Like lots of people have either done something like it or close to it. And so the fire tornado used to be this like thing you get like a trash can that had like kind of like holes in the side and then you would spin it like a small one and it would create a vortex and it was really cool. So we thought, hey, like, how would you go bigger with this? And people have done this too with lots of fans. So we wanted to put our own spin on it and say, how would we make this even wilder? And so I liked the idea that there were fans. The problem is that the fans always like distorted the view. So you couldn't really see like at the base of the fire. So we created a fire tornado device, essentially a very shallow pan that would have fans surrounding it that would allow you to actually see the bottom of the vortex because it would reflect. And then we thought, hey, what would be cooler than that is if we colored it. So then we came up with um, hot pink and then bright green and then blue is sort of the standard color for, for methanol. And so, um, oh God, here we go. <laughs> now she's just wagging her tail. Okay, I think, I, think, I think the storm's over. <laughs> um, so the idea was basically like, how would you create this sort of like magical looking fire tornado? And we we really amped it up. And so we got it to be about like 20 feet tall inside of a warehouse. Because the big problem too was that most people when they did this experiment, they weren't doing it inside. And so the wind would take it and you would have to have something that had so much um, fire, so much flame, like gasoline would provide this. But methanol is the only thing that, would burn so low that you could put color into it. So there was quite a bit of problem solving and we figured out, okay, you can do this in a giant warehouse. You have to have a flat sort of surface. You need to then blend in the uh, lithium and the boric acid, the boron in order to get those colors. You mix them all together. You get a multi-colored fire tornado that's 20 foot tall inside of a warehouse. So it's, yeah. <laughs> do, do any of these trial and errors involve trips to the hospital? Uh, not yet. I have been to the hospital, so I'm familiar. In fact, the one hospital journey that I actually went on was not with my own production. Uh, it was with the, this weather channel job. I, I was producing a show about how to, um, basically get, uh, it was like different ways to de-ice your windshield. And I was holding a four inch titanium razor blade to scrape ice off of a windshield even though that like was not what we wanted. We wanted like a really poorly designed plastic scraper. And I was holding the backside of a windshield inside of an ice truck. And I went up the, the and it, yep. I mean, I just don't even say it. Like you can just, you can feel it. And I sliced all four fingers with a titanium razor blade uh, to basically like show that you can, you know, take ice. But it was like, so it was like, it didn't make any sense. It was like, of course you can do that with a razor blade. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, but every, you know what? Since then, I feel like safety has literally been our number one priority. <laughs> so um, up until as of now, nothing crazy. Um, okay. So what are your goals for the future? What, what are you hoping to do down the road? Yeah. So we love what we're doing, right? And I started noticing that 
in order to do more and to provide more to the SciComm community, I would have to uh, build more infrastructure in order to do that. So we are creating the Science Factory. The Science Factory is a large production studio that has the open ability to work with other science creators um, to create, shoot, collab, do it all under one roof. It's also a business model that provides um, branded content and other opportunities for science creators that are existing right now. So we have a, um, a, uh, a marketing uh, influencer company specifically for STEM. Uh, and so we're, we're building all this out in order to basically be kind of this like large mega complex where science is happening all the time, 24 seven engineering, electrical engineering, chemistry, and it's all being done like under the same roof uh, so that there's this collaborative aspect of it. Um, Cause one thing that we saw kind of, or I've seen in the, in the sort of the 10 years that I've been doing this is that a lot of people are doing this, but all individually. And so there doesn't really seem to be this like collaborative effort all under the same roof. You know, people help each other here and there, but when you have a collaborative aspect of lots of different um, perspectives, lots of different angles and ideas and thoughts, that all comes together to create just really amazing, great ideas that I think um, can one, inspire a new generation of people who want to get involved in STEM and STEM technologies. Um, but then two, I think it provides a pathway for those who, or like, hey, like, I don't want to be a doctor, but I really like STEM. And, you know, and, and so there's no organization for that. Right now, it's kind of like, I guess go be a YouTuber or whatever. So we are developing a pipeline and a path for people that want to be science communicators. And we're, so we're just, we're developing that structure for those individuals so that in the future, they can have a position for that. Have you heard from parents or kids that of uh, people that you've really made a difference, people you've inspired to become scientists? So what's really cool is that we have. So we've um, we've been doing this up in um, San Jose. We work with uh, some manufacturers that it's a consortium of manufacturers, specifically in what's called advanced manufacturing. It's like making very expensive microchips. And so we got really involved on a very granular level, uh, doing tutorials and just working with people and in real time, you can have people say, hey, like I saw this tutorial, like we're working on this. Um, it's called Flex Factor. So it's like, it's basically like people come up with ideas for how to implement um, flexible hybrid electronics into the average day to day. Uh, and so a lot of what we have done over time, I think it started out being like, hey, I'm gonna have a YouTube channel. And I'm gonna have fun on my YouTube channel. And then over time, it's really crafted into like, how can we provide a stable structure, career pipeline path for science communicators, but people who want to work in the STEM fields. And so that's really our main focus. Um, I plan on showing my son your YouTube channel, but I am a little worried he's gonna become addicted and start to blow up things in the house because we're constantly, I mean, I can't keep baking soda and vinegar in stock in my house. It disappears like crazy. I was gonna ask you about equipment. If somebody wants to just have some fun at home with their kids, can you recommend any kind of low budget things that they can do? 100% an iPhone. Literally, this is not an endorsement for Apple or whatever. <laughs> it's just like anything, like, I think the iPhone is very simple. I mean, or a Samsung or whatever, like any, any, basically like any smartphone. I think there was, um, at least from my generation, there was this idea that you needed like lights and you needed a really fancy camera. Just for perspective, we have a $20,000 camera that we like shoot on and it gets the same views as our iPhone 10. So it's like, you just don't need fancy equipment. You just need the ability to shoot it, shoot it vertical, shoot it horizontal, whatever, and then piece it together. I mean, there's editing software actually on every MacBook. Um, there's like free editing software. It, sometimes it just comes on your phone. You can just piece it together. Um, iMovie, it, it's simple. And so honestly, I think just getting started. Hey, there she is. There's a princess. <laughs> Um, but, um, honestly, it's like, it's as simple as that. I think the internet appreciates, um, good ideas over good quality, specifically quality of the film, like quality of the actual production, not quality of the concept. So I think quality of the concept always wins. Um, you don't need fancy equipment. You get started with the phone. What about science experiments? What can I do with my kids this weekend with what I have in the house? Oh, there is tons of stuff. If you've ever seen this channel called The King of Random, um, that's a great place to start. Lots of at-home, really fun, interesting things. I think the best place 
is to if if and this is just a personal experience like when i saw that there were organisms in the water it had literally changed the way my brain operated i mean just it really opened up possibility wow there's just so much of the world i don't know about if you can do that with your kids right with any kind of experiment you know it's like we're going to put these two chemicals together baking soda and vinegar and this thing happens and it it's changing their perception of reality that's where you get people hooked in stem and i and i and i think truly that this country right uh with the pipeline of stem and steam i think that's a direction we need to focus on more in general um and open that up to a diverse field of of all individuals i think that's that's the direction we need to go um just increase more eager desire to join stem fields no matter what that is well, you've definitely made those STEM fields much more exciting. So thank you for doing that for kids. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like.